Hello and welcome to this 10.13 update. I'm Kamal Takodra, Technical Marketing Engineer. I'm going to be talking about multicast updates, which will be pin by directional, followed by another session of multicast optimizations. So let's go on to the overview. So um, the first thing uh, that I've done here, um, and really multicast is, is a different type of language. Um, when we're talking about networking and there's quite a few things under consideration. So I've I've actually not only put definitions, but I've actually put how that definition operates. So it's really important that we understand these. I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is a great reference to educate yourself around some of the um, terminology effectively. So um, please refer back to this slide. I've taken quite a while to try and really uh, focus and laser point into some of these definitions. So as I said, I'm going to be covering PIM bidirectional in part one of two for IPv4 and in part two of two, slightly linked to pin by directional, but for general multicast, I'm going to be covering some multicast optimizations uh, as featured here, but I'll cover those in that session on Thursday, I believe. OK, so let's crack on with pin by, by directional. Let's first of all say what platforms are supported in 1013 release. And as you can see, it's the 10,000, 9300, 8360, 8325, 8100, 6400, 6300, and 6200. So what is PIM bidirectional? Basically, PIM bidirectional creates multicast trees between our sources and receivers, so here on the left, without having specific source states. And what does that really mean? It means that we no longer have S comma G entries and they're not maintained within the system. So as you can see in the diagram, I've only got star comma G entries, no S comma G entries. So that means that source traffic in a PIM bidirectional um, setup is always sent to the rendezvous point. So this is something really important you need to um, get into your heads. It's different to PIM sparse mode. We always send um, source data to the rendezvous point. And what's the benefit of having PIM by directional? Well, as I've said earlier, we've removed the S comma G entries and removing those S comma G entries, which are shortest path trees, means that we potentially have less overhead on the switch resources. Now, more than likely, it's a good advantage to have only S comma G entries when you have to scale into large networks where you have a highly distributed sources and receivers, which typically can happen in an enterprise. So we'll be covering that in a bit more detail but that's the overview. So let's try and understand PIM by directional and compare it to PIM sparse mode in terms of how it forms its trees and some of the salient points. So here on the left, I've got a PIM by directional setup and on the right, I've got a PIM sparse mode setup in a similar configuration. What we see with PIM bidirectional is that we only form a shared tree across the whole system. And I like to call this the RP tree because we create the tree where the rendezvous point is the root of the tree. Now, the other differences with PIM bidirectional is in the name effectively, it gives it away. The tree can both send and receive on the links up to the rendezvous point which is different to PIM sparse mode. Now if we look at PIM sparse mode what we do is we do create a shared RP tree so you can see star comma G entries going up to the rendezvous point 
in some of these areas, be it source or receiver. However, we also build a source path tree. So you can see on this source side, I've got S comma G entries leading up to my rendezvous point on the source side. So we've built two trees in the sparse mode. We built a RP tree and we've built a source path tree. As I said, these are unidirectional, so we can only send source to receiver when we build that tree. So what that means is we've got to actually now maintain in a PIM sparse mode both the shortest path tree as well as the S comma G entries. Now the, the thing with sparse mode is we can optimize traffic because we take the shortest path trees. And with the RP, it's in the control plane for sparse mode. So a very important thing about PIM by directional is the RP in PIM by directional is both in the control plane and data plane. If you remember, I said earlier that the RP is always in the path. So it's both control plane and data plane. So it makes it very different. So we'll further now compare both PIM by directional and PIM sparse mode. Now, what I've done is I've got one source group in my PIM by directional here on the right, and I've added another source to and a group to. Then we have multiple receivers here where one receiver is interested in both group one and group two. We can see that. What happens in a shared tree environment? I build a star comma G entry for each of those groups all the way up to the rendezvous point and in the shared tree fashion. Now, if I look at that in the same setup with PIM sparse mode, I have to build a, a, a source path tree on both sides of my network. We can see the green source group is building a source group and a star comma G group for its specific group all the way to the RP. And conversely, the other group that we've added, source two group two, which is the blue group, is also added to the um, tree. And you can see at the rendezvous point, I have to maintain all of these entries, which is a burden on the network effectively. So this was just to illustrate that as I increase the sources and receivers in a PIM sparse mode environment, I'm getting a lot more S comma G and star comma G entries. And then I have lesser resources and overhead when I've got a PIM bidirectional because I've only got to maintain the star comma G entries. So now let's look at carry on with the overview is how do we build a in bidirectional shared tree. So first of all, we have to understand that a even though we have a shared tree for PIM bidirectional, we have also we have a what's called a receiver side shared tree and a source side shared tree, and they are built slightly differently. So first of all, we get the IGMP joins from the receiver hitting your first node in the network. And then those IGMP joins or the IGMP packets or the joins are sent all the way up to the rendezvous point. Once that's happened, we then get a source a, a shared a, a receiver side tree forming all the way down back to the receiver and conversely that happens to all receivers on the receiver side so i send my igmp and it goes all the way up to my rp and then i create a shared side receiver tree 
and I enter star comedy entries in the fib. So that continues to happen now on the receive on the source side where I've got a source and a receiver, I still build a receiver side tree. So I've got the IGMP join going up and hitting the rendezvous point and then coming back and making a shared receiver side tree. So hopefully that's reasonably understandable. So I just want to make sure I've covered all these points off. So we get an IGMP join. Now we do get, we have something called a designated forwarder. We have, which I'm going to cover in the next slide. So just hold that point for a moment. Um, we do have something called designated forwarder. It's been very important. So we see we have the IGMP joins that go hop by hop to the RP. And then we have the star comma G entries into the FIB. We also, which I haven't shown here, we ha can have prune messages. So we can prune back very similar to PIM sparse mode and uh, collapse the tree or remove the tree if we wanted to, um, but not shown. So let's talk about the source side. So as I said earlier, when you have a source multicast in a PIM bidirectional, we're always sending the multicast packet hop by hop by the designated forwarders within that network. Now, by default, no matter what happens, even if there are no receivers, the source will always send multicast traffic to the rendezvous point in a bi-directional um, multicast network. And then we the green arrows, we then go back and form a shared tree with a source side, and that bring, gives us the star comma G entries. So other things in the graphic, just to make sure that I've uh, covered that off, is we also have a source side receiver branch on the right. So if you see here, there is a unique point where we have got both a source and a receiver on the source side of the tree. So that's a unique uh, situation, uh, which I'll cover off later. So hold that point, it's very important, but um, we'll also demonstrate that later. Now, if we have no receivers in any of the network, we still will continue to send a multicast source. We don't have a PIM RP no register start stop. So that's maybe seen as a disadvantage, but um, we'll see that some of the performance advantages are there for Pimba directional. So next, let's cover off uh, the designated forwarder. So we have something called a designated forwarder and a designated forwarder election. So in PIM sparse mode, we have a designated router that no longer exists in a PIM by directional network. We have something called the designated forwarder DF. Now the job of the designated forwarder is to forward multicast traffic towards the RP. And each segment on the multicast router will have a designated forwarder per RP. So I've got a single RP here in this diagram and I've got a designated forwarder on link on each link or segment. If I had another RP in a different place, I would then have designated forwarders for that specific rendezvous point. So that's what that trying to say here. So in terms of designated forwarder, it does two things. Downstream onto a link, it is the, uh, it is the logical device that pushes multicast traffic down onto the link. It also has a job of picking up upstream packets off the link to forward to the RP. So this designated forwarder here is pushing multicast traffic down here, down the link. This designated forwarder here on the source side is responsible for picking up the traffic and then forwarding it on to the rendezvous point. That's all that's saying. 
So the designated forwarder is actually used to stop us having a uh, stop us having any loops in the network. We don't have reverse path forwarding checks in PIM by directional, but we do use reverse path forwarding just to see where the multicast traffic is coming from and is it acceptable to receive it from here. We also have a special use case or special uh, function, the designated forwarder on the receiver side where we have IGMP joins is responsible for pushing IGMP up to the rendezvous point and this combines in the outgoing interface list. So one more thing that's important is designated forwarder election. So we elect a designated forwarder per link or per segment. And this is basically done based on the unicast um, routing table. And it's the best metric to the um, rendezvous point, which gets the elected designated forwarder. Now, in the case of a tie break, it's the highest IP, so there would be no tie break in this network. But if I had a link in between these two aggregation switches or I had another router uh, going to the same receiver, we would get a tie break and we only have one designated forwarder. Very similar to how the designated router is uh, elected in um, PIMS fast mode. So we're still um, talking about concepts here. So, so basically now once we've had all that tree build, we've had the designated forwarder, I've put it in different slide to break it out, but that sort of happens all at once effectively. So once we've got that, we get multicast packets flowing from um, to the receiver side, down the shared tree via the RP, with DF forwarding. So we can see the red packets that uh, at the source, they're coming up to this aggregation switch, they're forwarded to this RP down to the second aggregation and then forwarded to the receivers uh, on the appropriate branches on the shared side tree. Now I did mention we have a unique point here where we have a source and a receiver meeting prior to the rendezvous point. What happens in this situation is that we do get effectively a shortcut on the um, resource side and the multicast packet will go directly to the receiver. However, if I had the situation where I had no receivers on the receiver side tree only, we would still send a multicast packet upstream to the RP, even if there were no receivers on the receiver side shared tree that I've shown here. And that's what it says here, a copy is always sent to the RP to, to facilitate multicast receiver side shared tree. Um, and if no active receivers, even, even if there are no active receivers anywhere in the network and I have an active source, you will always get um, traffic hitting the RP from the source. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of PIN by directional. And let's look at some use cases now. So typical use case here. Um, we've got a campus and a on-site data center where I've got highly distributed sources and receivers across the enterprise. So I've got sources and receivers in the campus, both the campuses, and also I've got sources and receivers between my racks too. So this where PIM bidirectional could be very useful because we have many to many uh, communications here and we don't really know exactly when they're going to initiate but we know there's a high distribution so example in uh, applications that you can see so uh, simple UPMP source source simple source discovery protocol SSDP which comes straight out of the box on a Windows device if you put that on there that'll start kicking up to talk 
Uh, another example is multiplayer games that have chat as well. So you've got a same source and receiver on the same device. And then looking at financial applications, if you've got trading channels and market data systems, so maybe a Bloomberg or a Reuters terminal, as well as a ticker feed at the same time, that could be a really good use case for it. And then maybe CCTV with high dense source and receivers. So trying to put the applications to the actual uh, functionality too. So let's look at the configuration. Now the configuration isn't complicated, but uh, what I've done is I've broken down it, what you should do where in the network so you can get a better picture of it. So I'm going to first of all look at a layer to access and the VSX aggregation. So very similar to what I had in the use case. Um, it's very simple on the layer to access switch. It has nothing really to do with pin bar directional. It's just a layer two switch. All we do on the layer two switch is we enable IGMP snooping. There's no pin bi directional functionality, so same as sparse mode. Where we do start to configure the pin bi directional is up here on the aggregation. So we're only talking between the um, VSF layer two switch and the aggregation. Again, we do enable IGMP on the device upstream um, and then simply on the VLAN that we're using pointing down. So we can see um, it's VLAN 11. We just enable IP PIM BIDR enable and that's the main command that you have to do. Obviously, we have IGMP on that um, interface too. And then we also have to initiate a PIM routing process too. And don't forget to enable it. I've done that a couple of times myself, forgetting, forgetting to enable it. And then we define a rendezvous point that is going to be in our PIM direction. I've got a static RP defined here. And in this VSX pair, I've also defined active active as well and that's optional to have that so that's the layer two access talking to the vsx aggregation now let's look at a layer three switch talking to that same vsx aggregation well again there's there's nothing too much about it but obviously from a layer two perspective where our igmp joins are we still enable igmp um, snooping on this layer three device for these layer two connectivity and then we simply enable pin by directional on the uplink to the aggregation as well as pin by directional on the port that's facing the vlan and igmp and again you must have the routing process uh, which we had shown before and then pointing to the rendezvous point which is here on this core um, switch here and in terms on the VSX there's no real difference in terms of the configuration here we enable pin by directional on the layer three interfaces and I've also done that on the transit VLAN. I've created a transit VLAN between the VSX because if I do have a failure here on any of these links, then we have a way of getting to this device layer three wise. And also in some scenarios, if you have orphan ports on your VSX, which is it enables us to send multicast traffic across that transit VLAN and again um, we have the router PIM that we had before and we're pointing to the rendezvous point and we've, optionally we've got this active active for synchronization of um, M routes. So finally we now looking at where do I configure my RP on the and I've done that in the non VSX course I've 
I've defined a rendezvous point, a single rendezvous point. So again, on my layer three interface, which is going down to my VSX node, I just have the pin bidirectional enabled. Obviously we have the layer three underlay or the layer three. Um, and then I've defined a loop back and I've advertised that loop back in my routing process. And then you simply put the keyword of pin by directional enable. And you also, obviously, every node has to have PIM routing instance enabled and pointing to that RP. Now, you must still point to that RP even though you are the RP in this instance. And then on the VSX aggregation, we, we have no real difference. The point to point link up to this device is enabled with PIM by directional. And then I've got the RP defined with the active active. So let's talk about some best practices. So in terms of best practice, I, I have sort of covered this, but let's formally go over this. So really you need to place the rendezvous point at opt optimal flows. And you can see that I've got sources one and three and groups one to three in the vicinity here. So they're all really here on the lower half. So I've put my rendezvous point here on this VSX primary. And then on the other side, on the right side, I've now added uh, some source, source five and group four, which is going from um, south to north or north to south because they're both way flows because I've got sources and receivers for both. So I've put my rendezvous point somewhere in the middle because I know where flows are. Um, the implement implementation for um, CX is currently to use a loopback for the RP in 10.13, so that's what we should do. And then I've mentioned that already, that we should, when we're using VSX, incorporate a transit VLAN with a lower cost across the ISL to account for link failures and for orphan ports if we're doing that in such a scenario. So let's go into some troubleshooting now. So in terms of troubleshooting, we still have all the existing um, PIM commands. We do have a few new commands that have come up. So we can do something called a PIM DFE, which is looking at the um, designated forwarder election. And we have some specific events we can look at in PIM by directional, as well as a diagnostic dump. So in terms of going through, um, it depends on someone's preference. Someone might want to go and check the logs first and see what's going on. But really from a sort of a bottom up, we should check reachability in the routing protocol. We validate the multicast specific configurations. We check our PIM neighbors. We check our PIM interfaces and statistics. We check the designated forwarder election as per the RPs we've defined. We check the multicast routes and then we check the event logs and depend on how you could do that first. And although not part of PIM direct by directional and inextricably linked, we should check IGMP2 because obviously that's a part and parcel of multicast. So I'm going to show some outputs here. I do have these in a demo, but I'm going to go over them now because I'll cut the demo slightly short then. So really good command is a show run PIM, and that enables you to see what's configured for PIM very simply without going to the configuration. And then you can drill down into those interfaces and see what's what. Uh, then we can verify PIM by directional neighbors by doing IP PIM neighbor, and we can see that we've got the bi directional capable. Uh, just as a side note, PIM by directional has its own types of special hello messages, just like PIM sparse mode has its own. So we can then check and evaluate the interfaces and their operating mode by doing a show PIM interface brief, and we can see that PIM uh, by directional is operating there and then we can go into more detail into each of those interfaces if we wish to drill down 
Um, then we can, which is not specifically a multicast um, command, but if we just do a simple show interfaces, we can start tracking the multicast traffic as uh, if we're expecting it, especially if it's an isolated case, we can do some um, diagnostics in terms of uh, deduction really for that. Um, and then we can check, the. this is a new command, check designated forwarder election. So it's a show IP PIM DFE. And I did say, so I've got loads of des designated forwarders because I've got loads of different loopbacks. We have something called an RPA address. So that's the rendezvous point address. You will see in other documentation something called an RPL. You won't see that in ours. That stands for the rendezvous point link. Uh, watch this space. Um, so you can look at um, the designated forward election switch per rendezvous point that you've defined, which is quite good when you're troubleshooting. And again, our standard show PIP M route, so we can look at our incoming and outgoing interface lists. Um, to check stuff and I'm going to show that as part of the demo. Then we have an events where we can look at the pin by directional, which is a new command and you can helps you towards troubleshooting to see what events are logged. Um, I've had this, I had this down as troubleshooting, but it's just really slightly different. You will see that when we're using VSX as a receiver in this case we have when we're using active active we have the primary as the designated forwarder in the vsx role and we have the secondary as a proxy df meaning it's not the designated forwarder and it's waiting to become the forwarder only if this node fails if a link fails this will still remain the designated forwarder. Hence, it's very important to have that ISL link with a transit VLAN so that if we needed to reach once there's a failure to go across and down, so we don't have a switch over. So all those part troubleshooting, it was really a point to note. So um, there's also a diagnostic which I've I've done a brief output here, which is useful to see, and we'll see that during the demo too. Um, so I won't go through that. That provides a lot of detail. And then obviously do a show IP IGMP group uh, to see the joins on the layer three device and on a layer two device, which I haven't shown here, do an IGMP snooping if you're troubleshooting at the layer two device. Next, um, I'm going into a demo. Um, so uh, I'm, I've basically got distributed RPs. I've got VSX active active. I've got some layer two switches only, and I've got some layer three PIM switches. Um, so I'm going to go into that. So uh, this is a recorded demo. Um, so we're trying out this out for the first time. So let me briefly go through the setup and then go through parts of the demo. So we have distributed sources and receivers throughout this network. So I've got a host here, uh, which happens to be this screen on the left, which is a source, and I have a receiver here as a VSX lag to, to this VSX pair, and this is this device here as a receiver. I also have two other streams where I have a green stream where the source is sitting off this 6300, and it's pushing out multicast packets to various receivers uh, in the green stream, which is group 239 1.1.1 up to 5. And that's going across different parts of this network. We also have 
a source in the blue network or the blue stream, which is a 2392.2.1, which is a orphan port off of the VSX primary, and it's going to various devices and endpoints throughout the whole of the network and also to an orphan port on the other side of the VSX peer. Now you also will notice that the sources are also receivers for other groups. So you can see that here on this orphan port, it's a source or as well as a receiver. I have a source as well as a receiver on this switch or this port as well. Now, all of these devices are layer three apart from this 6300 down here. This is a layer two, acting as a layer two only switch. So it's only have IGMP snooping and all the pin by directional is covered on this 8100. So we've covered all the scenarios. Now I've also got three different rendezvous points for each of my groups. So rendezvous point for red stream is on the 8100. Rendezvous point for the blue stream is uh, sitting here on the left. And then the rendezvous point for the green stream is all the way up here because I want to show a specific use case. OK, so the first part is just to just to show on the 6300. I've done a show run PIM as we saw in the um, slide set, and I get to see the information that I'm interested about, and then I'm drilling down into that specific interface to see what's, how it, and how it's configured. So the next part is that we're going to look at also on the layer two switch here, which hasn't got PIM enabled, and so I go back onto that switch and still do the show run PIM. And we've got nothing, so I know immediately that's correct and I'm not expecting anything on there. So what we're going to do is we're going to now start a we're going to have a look at this VSX pair and see what it looks like prior to starting off a multicast stream between the source here and the receiver here. And this is the window on the top is the, the source and the window uh, video window on the left is the receiver. So let's uh, kick that off. And this is a bit of an explanation of what I've just went over. So I've now logged on to the VSX primary and I'm going to do a show IPM route and I should have no routes because I've got no multicast. So let's go across to the peer, the second peer and do the same. And again, I've got no multicast routes and that's why I expect because I've got no multicast streams or any IGMP joins going on in the network. So I'm going to go across to the source and I'm going to kick that off. That's the top left video so so i pressed the play button and that started the source and you can see immediately below the receiver below is now replicating that video stream so we should go back now and see what we get so i have a look on the primary and i do a show ipm route and we can see i'm just going to pause it very briefly so I can talk over that so we can see I've got that M route. I've got that group, the 2393.3.1 and I'm on the primary and I've got that group address. I've got single entry. Notice it's any. So there we are. That's the key about having the pin by directional any to that group. I've got my incoming interface, which is 1153, which is this link up here, 53, which is dot 51. And then we've got a outgoing interface VLAN 196, which is this VLAN here, which is the lag down to this server effectively. And my role is designated forwarder. So that's really good. That's what I'm expecting. So let me just play the video further 
and get to the next device. OK, so I've just run a show IPM route on the secondary. Now let's tackle the first part or, or what's shown below. Again, I've got the 239331. I've got the star for the any. And then I've got a incoming interface 1153. And an outgoing interface VLAN 196. But I'm a proxy. So that means I'm not actually processing the data because I'm in active, active mode. I'm just waiting to process that data. If I didn't have active, active on here, you would see me potentially processing that data and not really advised um, when you've got this type of VSX lag, I guess. Now we also have another entry which has an incoming interface but no outgoing interface. So well, that's expected, that's normal. Um, I think if you remember earlier in the slide deck, I talked about the designated forwarder sending IGMP messages up, but because I'm not the designated forwarder, I will receive maybe an IGMP and I would put it in my outgoing interface list and combine it here, but I'm not able to, so I'm dropping that entry. So that's expected and normal uh, when you've got this scenario. So nothing, nothing wrong with that. So let me continue. So I've covered that in the video, but I've paused and talked about that. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at multicast behavior. Now, I re remember that I said there was a specific use case when traffic meets prior to the rendezvous point. This is why I have this rendezvous point here on the left. I'm going to start traffic from this source to this receiver on the VSX pair and it's going to hit this node first and that's prior to the rendezvous point so what we'll see is we'll see traffic coming up here going down here to this orphan port and we also will see traffic coming up here so how how will we look at that in an isolated case this is really just to pro prove theory in practicality when you have loads of multicast sources it may be difficult to analyze that unless you've got traffic flow or visibility. Um, so we're going to briefly go over that scenario. So I'm just explaining that now and then we'll go into looking at the specific interfaces and showing that. OK, so first thing is I'm setting off the Ixia traffic generator and starting the traffic flows. So that gets started off. We just have a quick zoom in to show that that traffic is hitting. You can see I've successfully got the Ixia traffic now, I've got an initial loss, but we can see transmit and receive rate. You always get initial loss with multicast traffic because that's because of the way it initially um, comes through. So let's, um, let's, I won't forward this, it's just showing that it's traffic received. So we're gonna now go to the 8100. We'll zoom back out. And we're going to analyze those ports on the 8100. So what I'm gonna do first is look at, do a show IPM route. I'm gonna understand what are my interfaces? Just by looking at that, I can quickly understand this is where I want to do my analysis. So my incoming interface is 113. My forwarding interfaces, this is to the RP 1127. This is down to the receiver 1125. Now, on the layer two device, I also have an IGMP join, which I'm not going to be look at. That's come from the layer two switch on VLAN 100 
because the Ixia, even though I'm not passing traffic, I've made a join. So the Ixia decouples the join from the traffic. Um, so we won't see that. I'm not going to look at that, but that's why I've got that VLAN 100 in there. OK, so let's go across to the 8100 and first of all, get some more real estate. OK, I'm just explaining the interfaces, which I already did here. So let's just quickly fast forward. OK, so. So the first thing I'm going to do is just going to show interface so we know when we look at the interfaces, we know receive is here, transmit is here and the total is here. And if I look, I'm just looking at let's look at bytes. It's easier to see. So receive is in the first column, transmit is in the second column and total bytes are in the third column. So let's uh, progress this. So I've cleared the interface statistics. Now I'm just going to look at those three interfaces, 113, 1125, which is the receiver, and 1127, which is the RP. Just a point to note, I did note when you're doing this command, if you don't give these commands in order, I don't know if it's a, a, a a feature or something right now it needs to be tidied up they do come out of order if you don't do it in order of the interfaces just a minor anyway um so i've done an, uh, a filter on multicast and there you are so what i've got is multicast traffic inbound we can see we've got 445 and some then on 1125 which is the receiver on the VSX pair on the orphan port, I've got the same amount of packets because I've cleared the statistics. So that proves that the main of the traffic that I've got multicast wise is there. And then this is the last interface towards the rendezvous point. Now, this rendezvous point is only on the transmit side of my 8100. If I was getting a trombone of the traffic, I would also get traffic here on the receive. So this is just proving that point case of where a node meets prior to the rendezvous point. That's really all that was going to uh, be shown. And in fact, you know, obviously if you've got lots of traffic, it's hard to decipher. I've got the luxury of having control over this traffic with the ICSI and showing it to prove a functionality point to you guys to get a better understanding. So the rest of this shows just outputs and I'm going to uh, accelerate the demo um, and just get to some outputs of a bit more interest because those outputs were all uh, covered in the troubleshooting section. So there was some outputs that I wanted to look at specifically. Um, and this was one of them actually where I've done more details on the interface. And all I wanted to say, you can see when you're running this, because we have PIM sparse mode, remember it says operational DR priority not applicable. Configure DR priority not applicable. That means you're running PIM direct by directional because the DR has no function in PIM by directional. And, and, and also we can see, I mentioned earlier, obviously we've got prune available in the IGMP for the tree breakdown. You can see we've got some prune uh, timers that can be configured too. OK, let's let's crack on with this a bit further and go to some more interesting points. OK, so what I've done now is I've now set off every single multicast stream. 
So we're going at it on the network. Everything is being hit now, not with intense traffic, but with quite a reasonable amount of flows all, all over the place. And the first thing, obviously, we have success. We have no real loss. Uh, and that's why they're in one uh, color here. So I've set off all the streams. I clear the statistics and we get a successful flow. So but, but really what I wanted to show is what some of the outputs that we might get from that. So we can see when I run a show IPM route, I'm getting all of the routes. I can see what's forwarding, what's on the outgoing interface incoming. I can work it out and get a really good visual picture of how my multicast is operating just by looking at a specific switch. Um, let's carry on. There's one other one I really wanted to show. OK, all, all I've done here is I've added the um, other flow, which was the uh, 2393.3.1 because that's not in the Ixia. Uh, so that carries on showing that. OK, and so what I wanted to show was, which I wasn't able to show in the slides is when I've run these multicast streams, we can see that I've got events. I can see neighbor has come up. I can see interfaces, uh, what state they're coming in. And this is really good when you've got a lot of streams and you want. So it's really good to pick out the events, which comes more to home in a demo here. So and then there's one final one that I wanted to show was um, the diagnostics. So the diagnostics give you a whole plethora of information. And I must profess some of those I don't fully understand and have looked at, but you've got everything in one place when you run the diagnostics for PIM bidirectional. And you can see as it scrolls past all the information that you get, which is typically what you're going to. You've got the DF winners, uh, neighbors. Um, this is typically something that TAC are going to need. Uh, and obviously you can do that yourself and have a look at that uh, to get a first pass of triage, really. But really, this is information tech would like when you're run, running into some sort of troubleshooting for multicast. And then finally, all I've done is just um, just to finish off, I've gone on to the layer two access switch, which is a 6300, which is only running IGMP, just to show the value of looking at the IGMP snooping and seeing what groups are active and I've only got the 1.1x groups and 1.152.25 groups and you'll also notice this I've got a Windows device here so I've got the source sp sp uh, simple discovery protocol which comes by any Windows by default so that's UPnP that we've picked up on that join on a specific host. So that is the end of the actual demo. So I hope that was useful and informative for you.